Why don't we go ahead and get started? If people come in, that's fine. Um, I just want to welcome everybody. This is our monthly Oracle Temple Salon, and we switched it to this Zoom format uh, at the start of COVID. We used to meet in the Peace Pentagon, which is behind me. Um, and it's been fun to keep the tradition going, even though we can't meet in person. It also has allowed us to invite guests from further afield, uh, like Dan and Nancy. So that was the one advantage of switching to this format. We could bring in guests who um, were greater distances. So tonight it is my um, really deep honor to uh, welcome Dan and Nancy. Um, Dan Kahn is on the Leadership Council at the Peace Alliance. He's also their National Field Coordinator. And one of his duties there is to oversee and implement the Blueprint for Peace. And we're gonna hear about that this evening. Uh, he also teaches empathy skills to teenagers at the Community Connections Program in Tallahassee, Florida. And he promotes restorative justice practices um, because he's the statewide executive director of the Florida Restorative Justice Program. Um, he also is an active consultant um, and he produces empathy oriented videos. That's one of his specialties. Um, Nancy Merritt, who I got to meet a couple years ago, she's also on the leadership council at the Peace Alliance. In addition, she's the California State Coordinator for Peace Alliance, and she is one of the people who leads the uh, campaign for the U.S. Department of Peace Building, and that's House Bill 1111, sponsored by California Congresswoman Barbara Lee. <laughs> Nancy also works to secure endorsement of the bill with the California Democratic Party, and she seeks for them to include peace building ideals into the California Democratic platform. And she also has been involved with numerous other peace building and justice issues. She's worked with the American Indian Movement and peace building in Tibet. So I wanna welcome Dan and Nancy, and I'm not sure which of you uh, we're gonna go first. <coughs> you want Dan to go me. first? Okay, yeah. so please go ahead and tell us about your work and set the theme for this evening and then we'll have a discussion afterward. Okay, sounds great, Laura. Thanks, thanks, thanks for um, having us, everyone, um, and thanks to Laura for for organizing and helping this to to happen, um, and everyone else who worked. I'm sure there were many hands who it took to to uh, coordinate something like this. Um, so uh, I think the conversation that was happening earlier, um, both out loud and also in the chat, um, was very sort of appropriate to to our orientation. The combination of spirituality and activism, if you will. Both of those terms could you know, be, be defined and debated you know, in the whole seminar. Um, but yeah, the, uh, let me just lay out a little bit of the, the, my plan, our plan, is that I'm gonna give you some background about the Peace Alliance and uh, talk about our five cornerstones of peace building and give you some examples of that and then get into the blueprint for peace. Um, give you some a way that, that y'all can take action, or a couple of ways that you can, um, and uh, then a little bit about special projects, depending on, on time, and then I'll hand it over to Nancy, who'll focus more specifically on the Department of Peace Building campaign and legislation. Um, and then I, we'll, when we have time for questions and answers and discussion, we can get into whatever else anyone has in mind. Sound all right? Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, um, some folks might be aware that one of the founders of the Peace Alliance was Marianne Williamson, and this was around 2003, 2004. Um, other co-founders were Matthew Albrecht, uh, Lynn McMullen, Hart Phoenix, and Jeffrey Weisberg. And the Peace Alliance was also formed uh, in some consultation with, with then Congressman Dennis Kucinich. And uh, Dennis Kucinich, Congress member from Ohio, who introduced the first Department of Peace bill in this century. So um, I'll, I'll refer to the Department of Peace or Department of Peace building a couple of times. Um, a, a few years ago, the, the bill was changed to, to be called Department of Peace building. Um, and what it would do is to create a cabinet level department of peace building, just like we have a cabinet level department of state 
Department of Education, Department of Defense, et cetera. So um, we will get back to that and Nancy will give you lots of details. But um, when the Peace Alliance was first formed, that was its main um, and sole at the time policy goal was to create this cabinet level department. Um, and you can imagine with Marianne Williamson as one of its founders, um, a lot of folks came into this work and these goals uh, with a strong focus on inner work of peace building uh, combined with how do we connect that with the political sphere? How do we connect our sort of deepest dreams of our hearts with what can happen in the political realm? Um, and when I discovered the Peace Alliance around 2005, that combination of things really spoke to me. I, I saw some of Dennis Kucinich's writings and I had sort of given up on a lot of mainstream politics as a way to accomplish the goals that I, I wanted in the world. But when I saw these brave dreams uh, for the kind of a society that I really could envision wanting and working towards and that they were being put forth in the political realm, I uh, found some political activism that I could engage with, with a lot of my heart, if not my whole heart at times. Um, so that was around 2003, 2004, it was founded. There have been other policy goals that have come into play since then. Some have, we've had some victories in terms of budget items. Um, I'm gonna tell you what the five cornerstones of peace building are. And this is basically how we map out the world of peace building, okay? Peace building is a big topic. You know, it's, it's about violence reduction. It's about enhancing cooperation. It's about conflict resolution generally, but where does that take place? So the five cornerstones talk about where peace building lives and the way we've mapped it out. And it's for us, it's cultivating personal peace, teaching peace in schools, enhancing community peace building, humanizing justice systems, and fostering international peace building. So all this can be found on our website, peacealliance.org or peacealliance.com, we'll get you there. Um, but those are the, the five basic areas where we see applications for peace building, for programs and programs that work, that are effective to reduce violence, to enhance cooperation, to resolve or transform conflicts, and for the policies that can make these programs more available. And the Department of Peace Building is a, a central policy along those lines. Um, some examples. Now, cultivating personal peace building is not something that is typically done by legislation for the most part, right? Cultivating personal peace building, you might, it's whatever kind of works for individuals. It might be meditation or yoga. It might be walks in nature. These are the kind of things that can be promoted um, through policies that, that create um, different opportunities for, for free time and that kind of thing. Uh, but a lot of where it, it lives for us is in more of a individual focus. It's what we try to do. And, and we provide resources to our, to our uh, folks who are on our email list, folks who attend our monthly calls, et cetera, towards cultivating personal peace building. But the policies tend to live more in the other cornerstones, such as um, peace building in schools. There are, um, there are whole programs and schools of thought and trainings available for mindfulness in schools, for social emotional learning, for yoga practice in schools, uh, for conflict resolution within schools. And this is where things, there's substantial overlap among the many cornerstones as you, as you can, can imagine, because the schools exist in the community and there are issues of justice within schools and within the community. So those, those three cornerstones, you can see where they might overlap. Um, community peace building and humanizing the justice system in particular have substantial overlap because you might be talking about alternatives to incarceration, restorative justice practices, diversion programs for youth or adults. Are there ways of addressing justice and addressing community health and safety that may be more effective, less punitive, ways to reduce incarceration and also reduce recidivism? So I'm giving you a real nutshell overview, but again, on our website, if you wanna get into the details of this, there are specific details for programs and tools within each of the cornerstones that you can find, but I'm sort of painting a broad picture. And then uh, within the 
fostering international peace building area, there again are tools, programs, practices that have proven effective in international peace building, such as some of the departments within the US Agency for International Development, USAID, and also within the State Department have been specifically focused on multi-stakeholder conflict resolution, violence reduction, some of it in the aftermath of a conflict, some of it in the aftermath of a disaster. There are ways of people coming together, hearing each other, working together toward a solution. And something that has been remarkable to me since I got more and more deeply into this field is how similar the tools are. Whether you're talking about an international conflict or a crisis, or you're talking about ways for kindergartners to express themselves and to be heard and to resolve conflicts that occur there. The tools tend to be quite similar. We're talking about opportunities for people to be heard, ways for their needs to be recognized, looking for strategies that can meet the needs of various parties and some sort of agreement or commitment to take action follow through towards redressing harm and preventing future harm. So these are the kind of things that are as useful in, a, in an elementary school classroom in some ways as they are in an international conflict zone. Not to oversimplify, there are plenty of complex issues that come up. And if, if you're working in a particular part of the world internationally, you'll want to know what are the cultural, what's the cultural background, what are some of the ethnic issues that, that may have happened or religious issues. And some of the fundamental tools will be similar to what you would use with, with a kindergarten class or with people in, in a neighborhood in a dispute over property or noise or what have you. So it's a, it's a various tool sets that are pretty similar across the board. Um, the blueprint for peace, and, and this is something that, that you, folks who contacted us particularly expressed interest in. The blueprint for peace is um, an affirmation of commitment and care about promoting these tools that I mentioned across the spectrum of the cornerstones. So there are policies that arise that would create more opportunities for social emotional learning in school, that would create more opportunities for restorative practices in our justice systems, that would create more opportunities for multi-stakeholder peace building operations internationally. Those policies can, can be broadly described as peace building and the blueprint for peace is a call for a commitment um, on the part of individuals to support these things, to say, yes, we think this is a wonderful idea, let's see more of this, and for elected officials to keep a close eye out for these policies, to commit themselves to care and to support in a general way for these practices and tools. Part of what it does, both for the individuals and for the elected officials, is education it brings to a higher level of awareness that these tools exist and that they can be effective and that there is a field that we're describing as peace building. So that's a lot of what the, what the blueprint can do is raise awareness, it can raise hope when people see practical, tangible practices that have been effective and can save money and can save lives and reduce violence. Um, and hope, as I, I probably don't have to tell you, hope to me is essential. I have to have a sense that something is going to work, that something may work. So to me, hope is motivational, hope creates possibilities. So awareness, education, hope for our neighbors, for our friends and family, and for elected officials who are looking at policies that could be useful um, in, this, in these realms. So I'm gonna put into the chat uh, a link that would take folks directly to the Blueprint for Peace. And this is a link that you can sign up for yourself. Um, if you sign on to it, it will automatically send a message to your elected officials um, in the federal government. So um, that will make them aware that this exists and, and it could bring to their awareness this whole realm of peace building tools. And of course, it's a link that you can share with friends or family. Um, and I also encourage folks to check out, as I mentioned, the rest of the Peace Alliance website. Um, let me see how I'm doing for time, 718. Okay, um, I think um, there's a, a special project that I'm excited about, but I'm gonna save it for discussion time um, just to make sure that Nancy has plenty of time to, to cover what she's gonna cover. Um, I'll just give you a teaser. It's about truth, healing, and reconciliation. 
So you can talk more about this during this call, or you're welcome to contact me, dan at peacealliance.org, at any time with further questions. So for more details on the Department of Peacebuilding bill itself and what it would create, I'll pass it over to Nancy Merritt, who's been an amazing advocate and trainer and coach and comrade of many people uh, for 15 years in this campaign. So thank you, Nancy, over to you. You're muted, huh? Okay, so yeah, what Dan said, it's all true. <laughs> So thank you for having us. And um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Laura Brown, Geraldine Stapleton, and Pat Simon, who are uh, fellow troublemakers in the Department of Peacebuilding campaign and the Peace Alliance. So these are folks we've all worked with for a long time. And, um, uh, and I've got to say also with Geraldine, I uh, shared the um, state coordinatorship from California with Geraldine and some others. So um, she's, she's our big um, troublemaker, especially with the California Democratic Party. So, um, so as I said, thank you to all of you. Dan mentioned that the Department of Peace Building legislation was our founding legislation for um, the Peace Alliance. Um, and he talked about the cornerstones. So to me, all of those, those are just another way of talking about peace building and another way, all of those are incorporated in the Department of Peace Building Bill. Um, so that bill is about um, examining the root causes of violence and the root conditions of peace to support policies and practices that make peace building a national priority. Um, a Department of Peace, a, a Secretary of Peace Building and a Department of Peace would ensure that there's ongoing presence of peace building in our government, uh, which now it's a little spotty, <laughs> but we want, we want to make sure that that peace building and nonviolence viewpoint is always there in whatever policies um, are being considered in the government. Um, and so as Dan kind of mentioned, the bill sets uh, sets the policy guidelines and includes several offices, including peace education, domestic peace building, international peace building, human rights and economic rights. Um, what else? Arms control and disarmament, technology for peace and peace information and research. So it's pretty broad, it, pretty, it cuts across a lot of spectrums. Um, the bill has actually been kicked around or the idea of a department or an office of peace has been um, kicked around in this government since our founding days or maybe even before. But uh, during the time of, uh, of uh, George Washington, um, two of the founding fathers uh, suggested that we should have an office of peace bill. And throughout the years, um, in the 1920s and 30s, there were lots of bills. Uh, uh, Carrie and Cat suggested a Department of Peace Building at the conference when the League of Women Voters was founded. Uh, during the 1940s, um, maybe because it was war years, there were a lot of bills introduced, uh, including um, a couple of Republicans. And during the 50s and 60s, there were at least 85 bills introduced in the House and the Senate. Um, and in 1979, um, Senator Sparky Matsunaga from Hawaii introduced a Department of Peace Organization Act, which ultimately became um, the USIP, the United States Institute for Peace. Um, so that all went, and then uh, when Dennis Kucinich introduced Phil in 2001, that was the first time really that the concepts of international domestic peace were kind of merged, that there, that there are root causes to violence and root solutions. Um, and so he, uh, he merged both of those ideas and he introduced the bill. Every Congress um, from 2011 when he when he Congress and um, 
At that time, we approached Congresswoman Barbara Lee in California and asked her if she would take over the bill. And uh, she was very pleased to do that. And she actually had helped Dennis Kucinich write the original bill. So she was a topological choice, a brave person. So she's introduced a bill in every Congress since then. So that's just a little bit of the, of the background. Um, let me see. So the current bill, the, the uh, Act of 2021 was just introduced a couple of weeks ago. And I'm just going to touch on this thing and wants to talk about it, but um, this current was introduced a week before um, Barbara, Lee's, um, Barbara Lee's bill for a commission for truth, racial, racial healing transformation which also has a companion bill in the Senate by Cory Booker. And um, within the current Department of Peace Building bill is also embedded that idea of a commission for, for truth and racial healing. So that's, um, so they're very intertwined. And uh, it's, it's, I think people are becoming more and more aware of that we have to deal, at peace we have to deal with with past and reconcile and go forward. Um, so what can I say about the new bill? Um, there's there's a ton of changes in it, uh, updates from the last from the last bill, um, all really good ones we think. And we partly think that because most changes were ones we suggested. So of course we think they're great changes. <laughs> um, so in that, um, Barbara Lee talks about systemic uh, racism is a significant driver of violence and a key obstacle to peace in the United States. And Interim says we should have this truth um, commission. Um, some of the new language includes address, uh, uh, addressing the interconnection of life and the intersectionality of peace, justice, equality, planetary survival, and various other aspects of, um, of our lives, really. Um, let's see, I'll just tell you a couple more highlights. Um, in, the idea, in the realm of peace education, which is, um, I think most of us would say is pretty foundational if we're gonna, if we're gonna move forward, we have to educate our children and ourselves about what it means. And um, so we had included in past bills, a lot of the things Dan mentioned, like uh, social emotional learning and mindfulness and all that kind of stuff, anti-bullying and anti-harassment and nonviolent conflict resolution. But we added to this bill, the importance in peace education of also, um, studying the civil rights movement, the human rights movement, uh, the contributions of different races and ethnicities to, to education and um, that kind of thing. Um, we put in um, developing violence prevention and violence de-escalation training for the general public as well as for kids. So, um, so that's part of it. And then there's a lot of other things uh, relating to arms, arms control and nuclear weapons, including um, health and medical ideas and the whole thing. Um, and just a whole, I mean, I could go on a whole litany of things, but um, it's a really powerful bill. Um, at the end, there's a section of uh, people who should be consulted. Um, and we added to that tribal governments should be included in being consulted about these various programs and um, prioritizing those who are most impacted by related programs. And uh, a lot of that comes actually uh, directly from the idea of uh, Youth Promise Act and some of the uh, ideas that Dan was talking about. So, um, we're in the process right now of, of getting new co-sponsors for the bill. So of course we encourage each of you to contact your members of Congress and ask them to sign on. Um, what else can I tell you? We, we promote this uh, through a, a lot of different ways, but right now we're in the middle of the season for nonviolence. 
and um, using that as a time to promote the bill and to, mo to promote the idea and people who um, practice nonviolence. Um, what else can I tell me when my time is about up because I'm, I'm not quite sure when I'm supposed to end. <laughs> um, Oh, just a little bit about the truth and reconciliation bills. Uh, they encompass uh, so racial healing for a broad spectrum of groups who've been impacted in this country. So not only African Americans, but Native Americans and Mexican Americans, Latinos, uh, Puerto Rican citizens, um, the Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, and uh, Native Hawaiians. So there's a there's a big part of our history we need to look at and, and figure out how we're gonna do better in the future. Um, oh, then I'll just mention, uh, so we also ask groups to, uh, to be endorsers of the, of the bill and we thank you guys for signing on to do that. Uh, we currently have over 200 groups across the country who do that. And if all of you, if any of you are affiliated with other groups or um, know of others, we always welcome their endorsements. So you can uh, write to me at nancy at peacealliance.org. We also have, um, I think it's 43 cities, counties, and tribal um, endorsers. Uh, so that's another another thing you could do is if you feel ambitious to get your city council to endorse. And uh, so right now we have uh, those cities represent somewhere slightly under 18 million people. And I think I'll stop here and let you guys, um, you know, let you move on to the next part, but I, I thank you and we welcome any questions. Thank you very much, um, Nancy and Dan. Uh, the organization is just doing incredible work. 